This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tremendous Trifles by G. K. Chesterton Chapter 35 A Glimpse of My Country Whatever is it that we are all looking for, I fancy that it is really quite close. When I was a boy I had a fancy that heaven or fairyland or whatever I called it was immediately behind my own back, and that this was why I could never manage to see it. However often I twisted and turned to take it by surprise. I had a notion of a man perpetually spinning round on one foot like a teetotum in the effort to find that world behind his back which continually fled from him. Perhaps this is why the world goes round. Perhaps the world is always trying to look over its shoulder and catch up with the world, which always escapes it, yet without which it cannot be itself. In any case, as I have said, I think that we must always conceive of that which is the goal of all our endeavors as something which is in some strange way near. Science boasts of the distance of its stars, of the terrific remoteness of the things of which it has to speak. But poetry and religion always insist upon the proximity, the almost menacing closeness of the things with which they are concerned. Always the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and looking-glass land is only through the looking-glass. So I, for one, should never be astonished if the next twist of a street led me to the heart of that maze in which all the mystics are lost. I should not be at all surprised if I turned one corner in Fleet Street and saw a yet queerer-looking lamp. I should not be surprised if I turned a third corner and found myself in Elfland. I should not be surprised at this, but I was surprised the other day at something more surprising. I took a turn out of Fleet Street and found myself in England. The singular shock experienced perhaps requires explanation. In the darkest or the most inadequate moments of England, there is one thing that should always be remembered about the very nature of our country. It may be shortly stated by saying that England is not such a fool as it looks. The types of England, the externals of England, always misrepresent the country. England is an oligarchical country, and it prefers that its oligarchy should be inferior to itself. The speaking in the House of Commons, for instance, is not only worse than the speaking was, it is worse than the speaking is in all or almost all other places in small debating clubs or casual dinners. Our countrymen probably prefer this solemn futility in the higher places of the national life. It may be a strange sight to see the blind leading the blind, but England provides a stranger. England shows us the blind leading the people who can see. And this again is an understatement of the case. For the English political aristocrats not only speak worse than many other people, they speak worse than themselves. The ignorance of statesmen is like the ignorance of judges, an artificial and affected thing. If you have the good fortune really to talk with a statesman, you will be constantly startled with his saying quite intelligent things. It makes one nervous at first, and I have never been sufficiently intimate with such a man to ask him why it was a rule of his life in Parliament to appear sillier than he was. It is the same with the voters. The average man votes below himself. He votes with half a mind or with a hundredth part of one. A man ought to vote with the whole of himself as he worships or gets married. A man ought to vote with his head and heart, his soul and stomach, his eye for faces and his ear for music. Also, when sufficiently provoked, with his hands and feet. If he has ever seen a fine sunset, the crimson color of it should creep into his vote. If he has ever heard splendid songs, they should be in his ears when he makes the mystical cross. But as it is, the difficulty with English democracy at all elections is that it is something less than itself. 
the question is not so much whether only a minority of the electorate votes the point is that only a minority of the voter votes this is the tragedy of england you cannot judge it by its foremost men its types do not typify and on the occasion of which i speak i found this to be so especially of that old intelligent middle class which i had imagined had almost vanished from the world it seemed to me that all the main representatives of this middle class had gone off in one direction or in the other they had either set out in pursuit of the smart set or they had set out in pursuit of the simple life i cannot say which i dislike more myself the people in question are welcome to have either of them or as is more likely to have both in hideous alternations of disease and cure but all the prominent men who plainly represent the middle class have adopted either the single eyeglass of mr chamberlain or the single eye of mr bernard shaw the old class that i mean has no representative its food was plentiful but it had no show its food was plain but it had no fads it was serious about politics and when it spoke in public it committed the solecism of trying to speak well i thought that this old earnest political england had practically disappeared and as i say i took one turn out of fleet street and found a room full of it at the top of the room was a chair in which johnson had sat the club was a club in which wilkes had spoken in a time when even the near-do-well was virile but all these things by themselves might be merely archaism the extraordinary thing was that this hall had all the hubbub the sincerity the anger the oratory of the eighteenth century the members of this club were of all shades of opinion yet there was not one speech which gave me that jar of unreality which i often have in listening to the ablest men uttering my own opinion the toryism of this club was like the toryism of johnson a toryism that could use humour and appeal to humanity the democracy of this club was like the democracy of wilkes a democracy that can speak epigrams and fight duels a democracy that can face things out and endure slander the democracy of wilkes or rather the democracy of fox one thing specially filled my soul with the soul of my fathers each man speaking whether he spoke well or ill spoke as well as he could from sheer fury against the other man this is the greatest of our modern descents that nowadays a man does not become more rhetorical as he becomes more sincere an eighteenth-century speaker when he got really and honestly furious looked for big words with which to crush his adversary the new speaker looks for small words to crush him with he looks for little facts and little sneers in a modern speech the rhetoric is put into the merely formal part the opening to which nobody listens but when mr chamberlain or a moderate or one of the harder kind of socialists becomes really sincere he becomes cockney the destiny of the empires or the destiny of humanity do well enough for mere ornamental preliminaries but when the man becomes angry and honest then it is a snarl where do we come in it's your money they want the men in this eighteenth-century club were entirely different they were quite eighteenth-century each one rose to his feet quivering with passion and tried to destroy his opponent not with sniggering but actually with eloquence i was arguing with them about home rule at the end i told them why the english aristocracy really disliked an irish parliament because it would be like their club i came out again into fleet street at night and by a dim lamp i saw pasted on some tawdry nonsense about wastrels and how london was rising against something that london had hardly heard of then i suddenly saw as in one obvious picture that the modern world is an immense and tumultuous ocean 
full of monstrous and living things and i saw that across the top of it is spread a thin very thin sheet of ice of wicked wealth and of lying journalism and as i stood there in the darkness i could almost fancy that i heard it crack the end of chapter thirty five